The Lord be with you and also with you. Welcome to worship on this Sunday, July the 11th, uh, 2021. This service is a bit different. It will be uh, without uh, Michelle playing the piano or David leading the singing. And the reason for that is our, our technical staff, Jerry Norris and his group, some of them were unavailable uh, on Sunday the 11th. And so our pre-recording was not going to be able to uh, have its normal, f our, our actual recording was not going to be able to have its normal form. So we are pre-recording this as we did uh, in some ways uh, early in the COVID period. So, no uh, instrumental music and no singing, but we will uh, work our way through from the opening scripture, uh, through the prayers, the preaching, etc. We're grateful that you're here today. Please consult the website uh, or the church newsletter for information about the programs of the church. Uh, we were on the church parking lot on July the 4th uh, for a great outdoor service early, but we are back in the sanctuary, and this morning, as part of the service, our Communion Sunday has shifted from uh, first Sunday in July to second Sunday because of that outdoor July 4th service. So if you would like to place the recording on pause and uh, go and retrieve from your refrigerator or wherever, uh, juice or wine or water, something to, to drink, and then a piece of bread or a cracker uh, for Communion so you can just keep rolling or you can pause after the sermon and go pick up those items. We're grateful that you are here. Uh, the ministries of First Presbyterian Church continue this summer. So uh, stay posted on that. And again this morning, we are worshiping God. Our opening sentences are from the book of the prophet Isaiah chapter 55 at verse 1. Give attention everyone who is thirsty. Come to the waters. Receive what is so blessed as a gift that no money can make the purchase. Friends, grace is here. Be welcome and receive. Let us pray together a prayer of praise and confession. We praise and honor you, wondrous God, since nothing we do can earn your favor. Receive our praise and inform our thoughts, relationships, and identity. Hear us also confessing how we have been passive when you call us to active exercises of faith and serving. How we have been impulsive, compulsive, and controlling when you seek our stillness and listening. Encounter us with compassion. Forgive us. Heal us. Grow your wisdom within us. Lead us to be invested healthily with your people near and far in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. So let us pray in silence. Friends, hear, trust, proclaim, and share with others the heart of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our scripture this morning is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, and then moving to verses 25 and 26. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the 1950s, during the 
early years of the post-World War II Cold War. In the United States, a social and political hunt for communists occurred, of which in an interrogation, the primary question was, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? The communist hunters published lists of names. Why? Because they, as one group of political zealots, judged other individuals to be a threat to their group and a threat to their group's desire for an authoritarian hold on power. They then lump associated and labeled those that they desired to smear as communists. Well, looking back, and we might even say reading back, we can see that their first question is an intentional uh, oversimplification. Reading back, we know that those who asked that question of others whom they accused of being communists were actually interested only in discrediting smearing and ruining those who might be their political critics and opponents. They accused others of being communists because communists were politically and philosophically opposed to democracy. And therefore, those accused of being communists would be shunned as anti-American. And yet, the so-called anti-communists of those days were not themselves proponents of strong democracy with the free exchange of competing ideas as a cornerstone, uh, with freedom of speech and expression as a valued priority. They were not supporters of a democratic society. They were authoritarians and demagogues. Yet the format of that threatening and oversimplified trap question of the, the communist hunters causes me to think of another but truly positive question related to our life as disciples of Jesus. Are you now or have you ever been transmogrified? Now hold on to that word for just a moment. In 2005, I was researching something in Galatians, and I ordered a book by a man named Graydon Snyder, titled Irish Jesus, Roman Jesus. And chapter two of that book is entitled Paul and the Galatians. The book came in reading that chapter on page 34. I saw a word that I remembered hearing once, probably because I was, I was told, here is an example of a strange but a legitimate word. And so there on page 34, uh, I read the word and I remembered back 15 or 20 years when I'd been told that word and heard it a single time before. Even then, I thought, yeah, I agree with you. This is a strange word, whether it's legitimate or not. And in some ways, it still seems strange to me. Transmogrify means to change in a substantial way or ways, including changing appearance or shape even. And sometimes the change in a transmogrification is humorous. Um, it, it may even lead to a person who's being transmogrified laughing and relating in ways which no one previously could have anticipated. For example, in the movie Mary Poppins, when the elderly all-business manager of the bank, uh, Mr. Dawes Sr., uh, quite elderly, he ponders a joke for several moments late in the movie. And then he repeats the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And then he is essentially transmogrified. 
He chuckles and then he begins to laugh and laugh and laugh uncontrollably. His, his chair then levitates and he continues to say that word, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, over and over and he laughs and he laughs and then the scene changes. And we are told the next day that that's the way he died. Don't you see? He died transmogrified. And his son said he was never happier in his life. You and I might ask, what's the difference between being transformed and being transmogrified? Well, being transformed can be related to one's inner self and to one's outlook on life. That is very important. But being transmogrified actually extends even further to one's known and sensed orientation, the, absolutely the way one relates and the one, uh, how one uh, understands the world coming back to you. So in that book that I purchased in 2005, Graydon Snyder makes the case that Paul, who, let, let me say, he does not use the term transmogrified, but Paul has first taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, that at the Lord's table, we receive the bread and the cup remembering Jesus. And Mr. Schneider makes the case that remembering includes being so identified with Jesus' life, ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection that we are changed in that identification. We are transmogrified. We become part of a community as those whose lives are changed through identification with the one who serves us at this table. Jesus Christ. And then in writing to the church in the area of the Galatians, Paul promotes this experience and, and this evidence in one's life as yielding a new identity for those who feel so identified with Jesus because they belong to Jesus Christ. Therefore, a person made new in Christ should never surrender to being made in the image that the culture expects. We should never surrender to endorsing the values that the culture expects. We should never surrender to embracing the religion the culture expects. Instead, you and I and others are free by the transmogrification of our identity through the Spirit of God in Christ. You have been reformed and you have been newly identified with this Jesus and life through Him. God does not ask Galatian followers of Jesus or anyone else, says Paul, to surrender to the image of the culture to surrender to the values of the culture or to surrender to the religion of the culture, whatever those may be and however they may present themselves. You don't have to become a Jew to be a follower of Jesus who was a Jew. You don't have to become a Catholic to be a follower of Jesus. You don't have to become a Presbyterian to be a follower of Jesus. As Paul wrote to the Galatians, be shaped and guided by the Spirit of Jesus and not conceited or competing. A while back I attended a memorial service uh, in a, another town several miles from here and at the reception following I discovered that the woman visiting with me lived not too far from a Presbyterian church with which I had been somewhat familiar. Since the woman discovered early in our conversation that I was a Presbyterian pastor, she said, the Presbyterian church in a town near me has had at 
at least their past two pastors be women. Hardly anyone goes there anymore. It's sad. And she talked a little bit more, but not much. But on my way home, you know how you, you review something uh, that's happened and you say, oh, I could have said this, or maybe I ought to have said this. Well, that process went through my mind. And, and on the way home, I reviewed that conversation. My thoughts were something like this. Yes, it's tough when any church loses membership, uh, so much so that critical mass, as we call it, for uh, self-sustaining support and strength is threatened. And where there are so many fewer people in the pews and expenses are greater than income. But I remembered what I knew about that church over the last 35 or 40 or maybe even 50 years. In its town, it had been one of the first white churches to invite an African American to preach and teach on special occasions, and not once, but more than once. The elders of that church received a transgender member in the 1970s. That church welcomed and accepted folk who were challenged with bipolar or schizophrenic or depression or alcohol struggles. They accepted folk in the 1980s who were HIV positive and at least one who was dying with AIDS. And as I reviewed all that in my mind while I was driving home, I realized that Presbyterian church in that town across the years had been in the process of being transmogrified. And then I thought, maybe I should have said to that woman, you know their issue, don't you? From what I know about them, I think it's quite likely across the years that they have been in the process of transmogrification. I'm wondering if you or your church in that town have ever been transmogrified. Then again, as I think about it, maybe it's best I did not ask her that. At least uh, I shouldn't have done that uh, without explanation. But if Paul taught the Corinthians and then the Galatians and others as Paul through the years of history and the canon of the scriptures teaches you and me that at this table we become a community with a new transformed and even transmogrified identity with our look and our relationships changing for practicing life ministry, death, and resurrection from Jesus. Then, you know, well, it's no telling what people will say. Maybe it will be said of us like Mr. Dawes Jr. said of his laughing father, they've never been so happy. So if someone asks you about you and this church, are you now or have you ever been transmogrified? Isn't the answer we hope with gladness to be able to give yes. And God's not finished with our transmogrification Yet. All honor and praise be to God. Friends, at this point in our service, if you need to take a moment and pause this video, please grab what you might need to be able to celebrate communion with us this morning. Friends, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and those who come to me and answer the door, with them I will come into them, and I will eat with them, and they with me. Friends, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
and all are well who take refuge in him. Friends, this table, your table, today has become a communion table. It is no longer your table. This is not my table. It is not a Presbyterian table. Your table and this table have become the Lord's table. And the Lord welcomes all who come to participate in the feast, all who come from all areas of the world, no matter what you look like, how old you are, who you are. God welcomes you today to participate in communion with us. So friends, know this and be ready to join in the feast, all ye who believe. Friends, let us pray. From the rising of the sun to its setting, and all through the darkness, O God, you alone are Lord. We give you thanks for every gift of your majesty and tenderness. From the deep blue sea to the mountain peaks, to arid deserts and great plains in between. As you have given each human being the high vocation of sharing love in daily responsibilities, receive with every heartbeat the gratitude we owe you for women and men, girls and boys, and for your journeying with each one through the thick and thin of all our days. We especially honor and thank you for the birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the embodiment and the fulfillment of both your teachings and the ministry of faithful prophets. In his name, and remembering his invitation and command to gather at table, we ask you to bless these common elements of field and vine, to be, as we partake, Christ within us, which is far more than we can imagine or accomplish. O oh, great physician, bring healing to individuals and to groups. Where infection has afflicted, where threat has been invoked, where harm has occurred, where fear inhibits, where grief stings, where worry stresses, aid all who are struggling and who are anxious. Stand between them and the sources of pain and injury so that forgiveness and recovery have an opportunity to gain the upper hand. We place now before you our individual prayers in these moments of silence. O oh, source of life and redemption, remind us beyond each person's experience of death of the whole company of those in resurrection communion with you. Also hear now again, us praying as Jesus taught his disciples long ago, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We give you thanks, O Lord, that on the night before Jesus died, he took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, our Lord took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, through this bread and this cup, we are drawn ever deeper into the presence of our Lord, who loves us so dearly. So friends, as we take communion at this time, I invite you to remember with me the love and the grace and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his body given for us that we might know new ways of living.
and in his blood, that we may come close to God, know God, and be forever with God. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Having been nourished and given drink from this table and fellowship, O oh God, take our minds, bodies, words, relationships, and actions, and break and pour and distribute these so that our outreach and witness as disciples of Jesus is your outreach and witness to all people from this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Friends, as you go out about your days or your evenings, wherever you are going after this video, please go out and be ready to be transmogrified in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.